begin with, I want to welcome everybody to SaaS Talks number 20. As I've sometimes said that when we started, we didn't even know what we were doing. Uh, and I think, Khadim, if I'm not mistaken, I did the first one with you as well. Yep. Uh, this was sometime last year. And it had just continued to sort of stay the course uh, for this time. Today is actually a special one. And the reason I use the word a special one is that our intent generally has been to discuss very specific topics. We'll discuss pre-sales. We'll discuss demand gen. We'll discuss inside sales. Um, we have discussed sales ops. We have, in general, discussed more of go-to-market topics than others. But we have discussed very many micro topics. The intent today is that if you think about how a newborn goes from being a newborn to an adult, what are the different stages and milestones? So today is a bit of a bird's eye view, combining a lot of different topics that we have covered. It's also going to be the last one for 2021. And the intent was therefore to bring it, bring a lot of these pieces uh, uh, together. So, I mean, in general, when you think about it, typically when people start, they have full stack salespeople, everybody does everything. As you grow bigger, you have more functions, you get more partition. And what we are going to learn is as, at what stage do you do what as your, um, as your company, uh, company grows. As always, um, this is meant to be less of just a panel. It'll be more of a discussion, though with a few tweaks today. Normally I get only 10 minutes to ask my questions in the beginning. I'm actually gonna extend that a little bit because I want to create that bit of a continuum that is there and then we'll open it up for questions. Of course, as we always say that there are many of you, actually most of the people who attend are founders or investors. A lot of you have, I know a lot of experience in building SaaS companies as well. Don't be shy, put up your hand, we'll bring you on, on the video um, so that it is a truly more of a, a discussion format. With that, let me introduce the two gentlemen on, uh, on the call. Um, we know that I'm trying to remember when I first met you, but it must be 2014, 2015, somewhere, somewhere back in that. And clearly I have met now hundreds of SaaS founders. You are the only SaaS founder I have met who came from Merchant Navy back to date. <laughs> uh, and that makes you very special. Um, uh, and I remember that I walked away from that saying, man, this guy's a rock star. I, I know that we were still not able to invest at that point in time. You obviously did very well. Um, uh, he built Cloud Cherry, and now he is the VP and COO uh, of WebEx Customer Experience based out of the Bay Area. So, you know, thank you so much. And as he was just saying, he just flew back from India uh, to uh, to US, which which is perfect because he's not on the he's not he's on the Indian time zone. It works very well for him right now. Um, and uh, welcome to Khadim as well. I know most of you know Khadim as well, but uh, um, I'm happy and proud to say that that was the first SAS check I wrote. Um, uh, at the time, I barely knew how to spell SAS. Uh, I have learned through the years in the journey with, uh, with Botflex. Khadim um, used to be at Huawei when he and Bara started uh, Botflex. I remember meeting them back sometime in late 2000, actually no, early 2000. 14 is when we met, I remember. And we have partnered since the end of um, 2014. Uh, so Khadim, welcome to uh, SaaS Talks number 20 as well. Thanks, Alok. I, I think most of the sales uh, organization, I think I've learned from you. Maybe you were the others. You should have been answering most of the questions here, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm theoretical. You guys are building it. And um, so, you know, we the, just to lay it out uh, for you, Khadim and Vinod, we are going to go from the ground up uh, in terms of where the journey starts and how does it begin to expand? How does it begin to um, uh, specialize? So we know that I'm going to begin with you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, unlike Khadim, you're actually a sales guy uh, before you started cloud sharing, right? And I'm therefore also making the assumption that you were the first salesperson at uh, cloud sharing. And like it always happens, usually founders are the one who begin to do the first few sales uh, themselves. At what stage did you say, oh, I need another person with me to be doing sales? What was that stage? Sure, so I, I was fortunate. We had a founding team of four and uh, one of the other guys who we call the spiritual founder of the company was also a sales guy. Um, so we have, there were two of us in the core founding team who were selling uh, uh, one was an architect, 
Um, now, I, I think whether you're tech or a non-tech founder, you are the first salesperson because you'll realize that someone who has conviction for the problem, conviction for the solution has been yeah. there, is the most compelling salesperson, right? I, I, I don't know if you, I've, after a lifetime of selling, I've realized the most, uh, the, the greatest sales hack is actually authenticity, which is the, the buyer actually believes that you mean what you say, that's literally it uh, beyond all the other, I'm, I'm talking enterprise sales, right? The big caveat is almost everything we're going to discuss here are enterprise sales. Yeah. SMB sales have a very different a different motion. Um, so so that that's where we were. But I think very early on, um, uh, when, you know, before you can start to think about specialization, I know we'll talk about that a little later. We knew that we wanted to make sure that as a founding team, we understood the pain point, the solution, and at least have one turn of the crank up to customer success, which is the, what we promised and sold is actually what's being delivered. Because oftentimes you give someone a knife and you say it's awesome for cutting vegetables and you realize that it's being used to, I don't know, you know, chop weed. And it's fine. They're still paying you money. They're still happy with you, but that's not what you sold. So now if you go to market next with good for cutting vegetables, right? You'll get a different kind of persona and your customer success path won't be the same. So really for us, it was not about time. It is about, hey, at some point in time where we understand the entire cycle from what we've committed and promised to what we delivered and a customer gave us a thumbs up, when we know that entire cycle roughly, is the time to start investing in sales, is the time to bring in someone else and tell them, I have seen the entire journey through. And for us, that, that was approximately... 12 to 18 months in wow. uh, into the company's life, uh, we felt it was enough because when you hire somebody, you can't literally sit with them on every conversation, right? Yeah. So if you've left stuff, at least in the primary uh, uh, path to product market fit that you don't understand yourself, then you expect someone outsourced on day one to figure that out for you. And, and that never, never ends well for companies. Very interesting. Very interesting. And, um, you know, Kadim, while Vinod may be answering your question already a little bit, you were an engineer unlike him. At what stage did you uh, hire your first salesperson? Yeah, I think it was a little, <clears throat> a little different for us, actually, like we both being engineer. Uh, initially, the first eight to 10 sales uh, I did uh, personally, uh, and then uh, we still didn't recruit anyone till we got the term sheet, right? So once you wrote the term sheet, uh, then we had some luxury to uh, uh, hire. So when actually I was discussing internally with uh, my co-founder, Vara, like, okay, should we hire an engineer or should we hire a sales guy at that point, uh, our first hire? So yeah. uh, actually, I remember Vara clearly mentioning that, okay, uh, we both are engineers and if we know what to build, uh, I think it's easy to build. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Like building is not a problem for us. Selling is a problem, right? Like, of course, we have done eight to 10 sales, but still we need to build a repeatable uh, sales motion here. So let's get someone who actually has done this before. So we, that's where I think uh, uh, let's, uh, that's around uh, eight to 10 customers we had. Uh, and we, uh, that's why we got our first salesperson on board. Uh, even second hire was a salesperson, third hire was a marketer, and then fourth hire was an engineer. So when we got that first salesperson, I continued to do the selling myself. Uh, uh, I asked the sales guy uh, uh, to shadow me for the first another three, four sales. And then he used to do the selling and I used to shadow him actually. And as, as Vinod has mentioned, right? Like when uh, at, at this early stages, I think most of the startups have not achieved the product market fit. You're still figuring out actually what's going to resonate with the customers. You're still figuring out the wow uh, stuff in your pitches. Uh, different uh, personas would be uh, coming to uh, coming on discussions. You might have to tailor your pitches and all. And the founders are the best person at that point. But as you as you want to scale, you want to make it repeatable. I think then best best to get somebody who has done that before. Got it. I have an associate question. Either if you can take it, is that I know that founders, particularly who are coming from a non-sales background, there is sometimes a temptation. Oh, I don't know sales. Let me hire a VP sales. And even as you're thinking, like Kadim, you said you hired someone who shadowed you, then you shadowed him. Would you hire? A senior salesperson at that stage, or would you hire a relatively junior salesperson who can begin to do the basic execution, but not at a senior level yet? So let me let me take this uh, uh, start with maybe you know, can take a time after that. So in fact, I would be at least happy if most of the founders are at least thinking to hire somebody in sales in initial stages. As you said, uh, assuming you're it's a non-sales founders, uh, 
because i have ended up seeing many of the startups uh, founders are engineers but they end up hiring a 10 people engineering team before even hiring actually for sales guy so i would suggest they definitely start with uh, initially one or two sales guys now coming back to your uh, question still we are still figuring out the pitch we are still figuring out the playbook right so we need somebody actually who can roll up the sleeves who can be a hustler who can actually work with with the founders in figuring out that uh, you know, motion i think getting somebody with a lot of muscle memory or a vp of sales at that stage would be an overkill or a bit too early many times i have seen that uh, somebody with uh, who is very seasoned or very tenured uh, they try to replicate the motion which has been working for them earlier yeah and that may be applicable it may not be applicable in your situation at this point so if the motion is not very clear i think better to get somebody who can work with the founders and figure it out that playbook first yeah so so my thoughts really quickly are when you look at day one sales right you don't have brand you don't have referenceable customers you're not going to someone and saying hey uh, prudential and i don't know you know axa using this so use me you're literally going yeah. and saying i have an idea buy it from me so i think sales skill as we conventionally tend to associate with it which is a very polished pitch the ability to prospect all of them are actually very least important you are actually looking for early believers in your dream who are willing to take the risk that they are going to go after someone who probably has zero let's assume zero customers right so that really makes the the comparison stark right zero customers why would someone buy from someone who has zero customers and if you bring it to that realm then you realize that the only thing that will sell is a, not only thing only set of things that will sell one is conviction which is look i have absolute conviction i'm here for the right reasons right second is skin in the game which is i know you're going to take a leap of faith in buying from me i have bet my whole life and probably the house i live in on on this dream then that needs to translate to a very very deep understanding of the customer problem we yeah. know that you lose 20% of your customers every year to churn and you know and and so on and so forth and then it translates to the ability the 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 ability to convince the other person that i'm actually building something most likely you don't have a very very polished product right yeah. uh, and and finally telling someone that i'm going to build something for you which is i have something it's it's in it's an mvp or whatever form and i'm going to make sure that this product evolves according to the needs of your organization i don't think anyone but a founder can can do that role there is no sales person on the planet who can perform that role because sales in a sense is specialization which is what's my variable you know what's my quota uh, get me after this their job is not to pause and ponder and reflect uh, and and so on and so forth so that's really it so then you ask about hiring the sales person um if you don't know all of the answers to all of these questions how do you get someone else who will do that right so my only one lesson or whatever guidance to any non sales founder is nobody is a non sales uh, founder um if you know the problem enough to bet your life to building a company you are a sales founder right and you need to go after a few dozen people and just tell them what your conviction is all about the same pitch you make someone to join your company or to an investor to invest in your company it is almost the same conviction you are you are espousing to a potential customer and hence you are a sales founder there is nothing called a non sales founder absolutely. that's that's just my thought absolutely so we know that khadim let's take the early 12 months 18 months i think that both of you talked about you are beginning to see at least some early proof whether that's five customers whether that's 10 customers depending on the size of your sale etc and you begin to believe that you need to hire someone you hired a hustler not a senior sales person usually what i've seen is that this first person that you hire is um i'm uh, constantly using arpit's language here which is full stack sales person which is they do the qualification which is sdr role and sales role etc and i'm curious to it's a two part question which is as you hired your first person was this person combining both the sdr role um, and actually for those who are listening that means sales development rep sdr and account executive or did you partition that right from the get go and last part at what stage did you begin to think that look i think i need to partition sdr versus account executive so i can start sure uh, go ahead you know yeah so i think again we are talking about enterprise sales right i think there is there's not a statistical answer to this but here's how you would want to approach this problem 
first of all if you don't know the entire sales cycle all the way when i say sales cycle i mean up to customer success right because uh, having closed a successful sale is not enough if your customers unhappy in deployment or when value realization phase comes right. they realize that it's not it's nice but this is not what i what i uh, wanted uh, because demos almost never replicate the life of the of the average user right demos are super user view of the world whereas the product is used by somebody else and the check is cut by somebody else so figuring out what motivates all these people at the end of that is you know when you have close to product market fit so coming back to uh, coming back to the sales org itself if you specialize too early what will you do in the all left brain people will say hey let's set up a checklist what's the sales qualified lead criteria and you put a lot of rigor into it right and you've told someone on day one to feel for a problem only up to the point that that checklist is filled up correct um, your organization as a whole might not have enough muscle memory to think through the entire sales cycle so you've essentially told people leave the ball it's like passing the baton right so long as you bring the baton here and it looks green in color this person supposed to run with it and i don't know how many of you are in that phase now but a majority of your conversations now would be yeah we got these 20 leads but you know they were not really qualified but we took them because you know there's no other pipeline and most of the conversations are around i am not closing enough because the quality of the leads is not good enough for some other mqls are not good enough or sqls are not good enough so i'd actually say that in that early phase 12 months of 1 million arr i would actually go absolutely against the grain and say do not specialize right again we're talking enterprise sales if you're doing smb you need ultra specialization probably from day one right because your demand gen is virtual everything is virtual right it probably an inbound sales model is not what we're talking about we're talking about more outbound sales model right or an inbound which needs a very long period of uh, you know um, hands on uh, activity before it closes and i would actually say do not specialize so that you have in your core team a set of people who understand the nuances of the entire sales cycle all the variations that come in it when that happens you are now ready to partition it and say now to add speed to my engine i would like my demand gen and qualification to to be separate from my you know post qualification to closure because now you can start hiring reps who are very coin operated right very quota driven and tell them hey i'm going to come and give you people who have answered yes to these questions have budget have problem whatever right whatever the qualification that they are how fast can you close and then comes the phase where you start to scale up your sales but till some number that number may be even 2 3 million arr it's fine one is not a, a, a number i would espouse a, a philosophy of having full stack sales before you start splitting them up it's very hard to split and then bring your org back again uh, it's very easy to break it up and think that you're doing the right scientific thing so take your time be very conscious when you pull that trigger khadim do you have a different view yeah actually i i felt like two sales professionals are talking actually so if i have to put myself uh, in those early days i'm not, i'm sure like most uh, founders are much more aware today so i'm i'm a f- big fan of uh, specialization but coming from the background actually you need to understand the uh, the process or that domain even to think what should i specialize on so to, to be uh, frank here like when i started recruiting the first sales hire i didn't even know there's a role called hdr exist right so so if i don't know about that role i don't know how do i specialize there so of course my assumption at that point was i'll hire somebody in sales uh, who would actually uh, take the lead uh, do all the stuff required whether it's a, a demo poc legal contracting and then close the deal i think that's what uh, i think arpit is calling as full stack right so that's how we uh, we gave the responsibility uh, uh, the first three to four sales person had, was similar actually with the dna Like they used to do, take it from the lead and uh, close it. And the specialization, what I did at that point was, okay, there's a, a full stack marketer and there's a full stack sales guy. A marketer generates leads and uh, uh, sales guy closes the leads, uh, taking from the lead to uh, all the whole process. Even the marketer actually, I didn't specialize at that point, right? So uh, we thought we'll figure it out which channel works, whether it's uh, inbound or uh, uh, Google Ads or content or outbound. So. Uh, again we can't do much there so uh, we started with google ads uh, with a little bit of content uh, here and there and we were generating few uh, leads a day so uh, again the responsibility was given to the marketer saying okay you figure out you experiment with a lot of other channels of course we were debating on a regular basis but the specialization didn't occur at that point the specialization was marketing generate leads and close the deals here but actually we know i will also add that 
I was more in your camp earlier, but as more and more journeys that we have seen in our portfolio also, I have now veered towards the um, side that, and I'm going to hazard a few numbers here, and I know we want mm-hmm. to be cautious while, while putting any numbers on the table, that somewhere in the 100 to 200K ARR range, or somewhere when you begin to have, I would say anywhere between two to four people in your organization, you are better off splitting SDRs and A's. And it is not because they need to be coin operators. I think it's for two different reasons. One is that you will find that different jobs also have different skill sets. And you want to partition, you you want to allow people to go into depth, even to solve problems, even as you're figuring out problems. When you go deeper, you, you, you just pay more attention to it. There is another reason. In many organizations where you find that uh, that SDR role and A role is combined, you will actually find like a jagged curve because sometimes you're just focused on closing the pipeline you have and then you're focused on creating a pipeline, then you're focused on closing the pipeline and therefore you sort of go sort of an up and down. You're not able to maintain a consistent momentum. Um, so I am increasingly finding that somewhere in that two to four, um, and I'm using the word salespeople window, separate A's and SDRs, um, the sooner you begin to get the hang of it, actually the better it is, even though the DNA of these early people is going to be different than the DNA of the later people that you're going to hire in these roles, in the sense that once you have 20 salespeople, you truly are hiring coin operators. When you're hiring, when you have three or four roles, if you're hiring the hustlers, the evangelist at that point in time, because a lot of that hustle and evangelism is going to come into play while selling because you don't have any references, no, no patterns, no playbook, etc. All of that needs to be created um, at this stage. I'm going to move on though from, um, from this question. Let's assume you have these three, four, now you have SDRs, you have account executives. In the early period, who did they report to in each of your cases? And at what point did you begin to think, I need somebody in a sales manager role also? And when you began to do that, did you promote somebody from in between? Did you hire somebody from outside? So uh, I'll start here. So uh, first of all, Alok, exactly uh, just uh, touching upon the previous point, we learned the hard way about specializing that SDR and uh, AEs actually. We started seeing those ups and downs. And that's where we realize like uh, sales guys are when they're spending more time on PG or uh, generating pipeline, they don't close the deals. And when they close the deals, they're not generating pipeline. And that's where we actually figured out the hard way. Now coming back, so I think the first four to five uh, sales uh, reps actually were directly reporting to me. Uh, uh, so now when we, were, we started getting more opportunities, when they started uh, getting, uh, uh, like each one was handling few opportunities and we I needed to start deep diving them. Now, I thought we need a specialist there, somebody who who is good at managing multiple sales guys, somebody who actually can work with the new reps, who can actually uh, go on the customer calls regularly with the junior reps and also, uh, and I had, to sp- I had to split my time with other departments as well, with product, with marketing, with other uh, customer success and so on. So I think that's where we thought uh, uh, I we need somebody actually to uh, focus on hiring more reps, uh, focus on mentoring the reps, focus on going deeper with the uh, reps to enable them and also work with the uh, deals to close and also pass on whatever learnings. Uh, in our case, we the first rep which we hired, uh, he was doing phenomenally well uh, and we promoted him to be a sales manager. So the other the three or four reps were reporting to him. Uh, further on, I think uh, once we got to around 10 to 12 reps, uh, and that's where we ended up hiring a VP of sales. But initial was uh, reporting flat structure to me and one of them, one of the uh, reps we promoted to as a sales manager. Got it, Vinod, in your case? Yeah, awesome. Okay, since he also closed the last point, I'll also close out the last point. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, I think one of the good things with a, a discussion as opposed to a panel is that it's okay to oppose, uh, which is to have an opposing point of view because uh, I think inherently you'll realize as all of you build your companies to scale um, that there is no one path uh, to building a company, right? right? Yeah. So I, I actually learned the hard way, especially when I set up the US team of specializing too early. Uh, uh, wherein new company, new one of the things we discovered that when you go to a new market, the, you have to rediscover your product market fit. Um, and in doing that, we thought we had PMF and we specialized too early. And then we spent most of our time on mid-funnel management, which is, was the qualification done right or wrong? So I would 
stick my hand up and say that no matter what you do keep your sales under one org which is till you've not figured out the entire sales cycle even if you specialize between sdr and an account exec keep it in one org because the day you are having a conversation around was the lead qualified in a fanot is the day very early on that is right you are optimizing for the wrong thing which is not to close anyway so no, to come into point that's a very good point that keeping it within the same org is actually very critical yeah point. yeah yeah that's perfectly fine to have someone saying look focus more on building funnel focus more on closure but again note that also depends on your arc if it's 2025k you need more deals to get to a million if you're doing 1500k deals you're literally talking about 10 15 deals right to get to a million for example anyway so to come to the sales org itself so because two of the folks in our core founding team were sales folks we didn't feel the need for sales managers early right um but when we decided that look it's time to start building the team you realize i i was a vp of sales before right so i was used to you know managing the funnel and so on and so forth but then i realized that my job as a founder is actually involves many other things yep. it is once you've discovered a few early customers you want to sit with them as often as you can understand what makes them uh, take understand what gets them to expand so you realize that you couldn't do your job full time and kadim touched on a lot of it a real vp of sales or director of sales whatever you call that person is essentially doing everything from getting seasoned reps in training them setting them up for success and if anyone sat in on a real hardcore vp of sales sales review you know it's nothing short of brutal right so you are literally on a periodic basis going deep into the funnel doing forensics on one deals lost deals and so on and so forth this is a full time job and hack so from our perspective it was not about skill or competence but when we realized that we had enough deals deal flow coming in wherein we'd not do justice uh, if we didn't give the sales team a leader is when we did this uh, is that bring in the vp of sales now in the us i took an entirely opposite uh, view i i didn't have a network and i said if i go organically building rep by rep and then hire a leader i will actually not set them up for success so in the us i took the exact diagonally opposite approach which was i hired a sales leader understand the key clincher criteria was is that sales leader willing to do the first few deals herself so you don't want a sales leader who's born a leader which is i need five reps to start working correct yeah. you want a sales leader who says i will close a couple of deals i learn from you i will learn my own lessons and then i'll hire a team wherein i'll start you know building scale so in the us we hired a vp of sales and then that person actually hired out a team in fairly quick succession uh, and i would actually now advocate that when you're setting up a new pod if you know what needs to be done hire a hands on leader and let them build a team so there's a sales rhythm and a culture network that they want to bring in that can be affected as opposed to building 10 15 reps and then trying to hire managers that's that's how i feel about it now fantastic fantastic so let's let's move on let's assume that your sales org has begun to grow you have done that basic partitioning of sdrs and account executives as it grows further you have managerial roles also some of you might have vps as well i want to take one point that now we know you talked about which is that you began to do geo separation in some mm-hmm. sense um it can be physically in different places sometimes even in the same location you can begin to partition your sales force saying this team is handling india this is handling europe this is handling us sometimes people do that partition by size of customers instead they feel that there is something different about doing 50000 dollar deals versus 10000 dollar deals and therefore you partition your sales force into those two kinds and sometimes people do it by vertical also they mm-hmm. will say that look this is the team that is selling to i don't know financial services versus this is a team that is selling to healthcare i'm just making it up my question is at what point did you begin to segment your sales force whether by geo or by size for customer or by vertical and which of these access was the first one that you use as a partitioning access sure kadam you want to go or you want me to take this first yeah you you can start okay so from our perspective i think you know today if you look at again know that all answers are subjective to your industry right so when we talk about uh, so let's say for example you're selling Uh, a product that applies to any industry vertical almost the same way you should not be thinking too much over industry verticalization but for us for example customer experience right and NP- even an nps benchmark is different industry to industry you know your customers are different delivery method yeah. is different so what we did was we did the specialization not at the sales level but at the consulting level 
So we had a small customer experience consulting team. And these team were typically people who were market researchers who were in customer experience consulting before. And in that team, we did a soft segregation that oh, look, these two people are specialized on BFSI because they took case studies, you know, win stories. They created templates and frameworks. Hey, if you're an insurance carrier, this is how you should be looking at your customer experience program itself. So we abstracted that specialization at that level. So we didn't have to do verticalized, vertically specialized uh, sales teams. But the geography one, we had to do very early because we were, there were two, three things we learned in 2015. Today, um, uh, you know, in India, customer experience spends are phenomenal, but that was not the case in 2015. So the first thing we knew that we had to leave India and our sales was high touch at that point in time. You know, I know for post pandemic, nobody knows that world anymore, but it was enterprise. It was in person. It was, it was that kind of a sales motion. So I moved to the US and our VP of sales was doing phenomenally well in India. We moved him to Singapore. So I moved here, he moved to Singapore. His job was to build out Southeast Asia. My job was to build out North America. And that's how we, we, we started on day one, right? And we knew we needed geographic uh, specialization. It was impossible to cover the spectrum. Even the inside sales team, which we kept centralized in Bangalore, obviously we split the teams that would service North America and the teams that would do Southeast Asia, not just for time. The time is the obvious thing, right? You can't possibly do both geographies together, but also the kind of conversation that you needed. Um, what attributes were important. One of the things, I'll tell you something very, very tactical, but it's super important for uh, phone sales in India, which is, I always say there's white space in calls. So what happens in the first three to five seconds when someone picks up the phone and says, hello, 99% of us are predisposed to a soft start, right? Which is, um, hi, um, is it hello? You know, and then and you're like, yeah, I'm look, oh, hi, hello. And now I'm like, okay, it's hello, let me, whatever. Whereas someone in the US and inside sales rep will go, full bravo and bluster like for a second right and it's high energy it is and you don't realize the first three to five seconds makes or unders an inside sales call so if you have to even split by persona who calls north america who calls southeast asia you'll have a different kind of a person dialing yeah. even the phone yeah. for north america just because of this small white space issue so i would literally do a test wherein i'll just say make a mock call and first five seconds whether selected or not is secondary you've decided whether you'll do North America or not, right? Just because of the small thing. Anyway, so there are many such tactical things. So vertical specialization for us, as soon as we said we need a new geography, we actually landed our people, we built our practice, split our team, and we always approached it like that. understand. So I guess to summarize, you know, in your case, you said consulting was by vertical, but the core sales team was by geo as a starting point. Kadim, was it any different for you? Yeah, actually, <clears throat> for us, actually, the whole evolution was a little different because our category was uh, new. So majority of the people who were trying to buy was early adopters, not early majority or late majority. And uh, second, actually, we also graduated from selling to small businesses uh, to enterprise. Right. So taking these two parameters, actually, initially, over all the demand generation was inbound as well. So with inbound, uh, deals would come or uh, leads would come across different countries. Uh, but one thing was very clear that we wanted to focus on North America because eventually we, we knew that we have to build a company. If you have to build a company large, North America market has to be uh, cracked. Uh, as soon as we got around first 14, 15 customers, uh, uh, out of that, like 70% would be from India. We had one or two in uh, uh, Europe and two or three in US at that point. Uh, we knew that we have to go to the US. So the, out of first three to four sales guys, you know, we we made sure that two, uh, I think three of them focused to US, that's North America market, and one for the rest of the world. But th that was very, very clear because I think making them work across geography was uh, an operational uh, nightmare, right? It was, it was really hard. So that's how we first, first step was to actually geo separate them. As we, as we graduated from selling to small businesses to enterprise, I think maybe that was around 2 million or 3 million kind of an ARR where we were getting both the deals, like small businesses as well as enterprise deals. Yeah. Uh, and same AEs were catering to. I think that's where we realized that I think uh, uh, AEs are spending too much of time on small businesses. I think it's better utilized catering to larger enterprises or enterprises. And that's where we created two different teams within North America, for example, or within the rest of the world, where there was an emerging team as well as an uh, enterprise team. So that was our second separation. Uh, once we once we crossed, uh, uh, you can say around 14, 13, 14, 15 million ARR, I, I think we've also started seeing a lot of uh, uh, 
customers potential customers coming in who wanted very clear messaging related to their industries because this was the early adopt uh, early majority or late majority you can say who want, who would not visualize the use cases actually we need to visualize the use cases we need to be uh, doing all the heavy lifting for them so that's why we need to actually start specializing in terms of vertical and industries so uh, around 15 million arr i think the third specialization we did was actually identifying a couple of industries and start and going deeper there so now we have a team which is actually specialized in uh, let's say insurance or uh, banking we have team for enterprise we have team for emerging which is the rest of the board so i think it was a gradual step at uh, each uh, you can say different phases where we started specializing well, that's fair and i want to underscore vinod's uh, comment earlier that look no pattern applies to every company every company is going to be different and you have to sort of keep in mind your unique dna but i am also a big fan of those three sequences khadim that you talked about initially partition by geo it's a very different to vinod's point even that initial pause that you talked about i agree when an american sales person get on the call it's a very different start than when you let's say sell in germany for example right yeah. and so uh, there is a lot of difference between the them them usually i've seen that when you get to about 10 12 sales people you can begin to do the partition between larger customers and smaller customers also mm-hmm. and the reason you don't want to do that too early is that because if you're all over the place too early then that's a problem in itself then you have an icp problem i guess to begin with in some sense but and at some point as you become larger you do begin to specialize by industry sometimes that's a layer on top not the core sale and sometimes it's a core sales i've seen sort of both uh, kind of uh, things happen one of the other things that some companies have done but not all i've seen that early on going back to overusing a pitch terminology of a full stack sales person they are sales they are presets they do everything they understand the product very well they can go slightly technical also they are the evangelist have you at, at what point if at all did you feel the need that look i need pre sales and i need sales and how did you sort of figure that out that look i need that differentiation in the roles so um e- even when we say that you have again i you might trademark this full stack sales person my okay. assumption is not that this person is writing solo right yeah. so for example a solution engineer or solution architect solution consultant what have you right um writes along with this person even very early so when i say don't split phases i'm saying hey don't make pre sales such that i only do pre sales i don't go anywhere else right yeah yeah so yeah. for example our earliest customer success customer experience consulting people obviously the customer experience consulting team job was to deploy your cx program correct right? so to architect your program for success they would do pre sales because they had yeah. to convince someone that hey we have a method and a process which yeah. is more than technology right yeah. so they used to do pre sales so whenever again in case i i confuse anyone by saying this this person even though they are owning the entire sales cycle are supported by different people we right someone who is a solution consultant someone who's a depend on on your industry of course so they are not alone right so there is someone who's doing technically the job of pre sales with them at some point in time of course you hyper specialize and you you split them out so just wanted to make sure that caveat yeah. is known to known to everybody yeah kadam you thought yeah so i think resonate a lot with uh, we know actually so initially uh, as i was Uh, like sales guys were doing everything so if it was a simple uh, out of box demonstration of the product or uh, yeah. simple pocs to be carry on just uh, doing a small nudges or small hand holding i think sales guys used to do all the heavy lifting here and since we didn't have any specialization in terms of pre sales the tech co founder my uh, varah who was actually who was actually acting as a pre sales he was also acting as a post sales consultant for the customers right? for customer success right so wherever there was a custom demo requirement okay we need to set up a special demo for a specific application uh, uh, he used to pitch in there was a specific question was on let's say how uh, secure how secure your product are how do we uh, deploy in my environment uh, so he had to jump in all those all, all those calls as as as, as an, again as the number of deals started increasing we realized this is a specialized role and i think we need to get a sales engineer here again when we got when we got a sales engineer I, I, as we not mentioned i think he was actually expert he was like a technical consultant who was working both for pre and post sales again I, again from there we specialized yeah. between pre and uh, post actually that uh, that was the motion for us 
Oh, that's a good point. I think early on, please don't create pre-sales as a separate function to another. It's not a function unto itself. By and large, I've seen product people also develop, implementation people also develop. It all sort of merges into one. It will take a while before you get to a separate pre-sales function by itself. Um, just, to, just to add one interesting thing, because uh, we know those calling about that uh, BDR specialization or SDR specialization. <laughs> so there, there is a flip side also I've seen when you recruit a first uh, US guy. And when your specialization is not in place, the person will come and say, oh, where is your sales engineer? Where is your demo consultant? Because they need demo consultants. Yes. So that becomes yes. another issue when you hire <laughs> very seasoned guys. Yeah. yeah. You're right. A very seasoned specialist will come in and say, hey, my job is to dial for dollars. Uh, someone else has to demo the product. Someone else has to whatever. And the point is, how early are you ready for that? Very I don't true. want to make one point though. Um, I, I'm glad we agree on this. And, and the role of the solution engineering team leader, whatever you call it, is super critical in enterprise sales because it is almost unfathomable. I know your demo environment works seamlessly. One click integration for Salesforce, one click, one click. In the real world, nothing is one click. But there are 6 million versions of Salesforce out there, right? So even something as simple as Salesforce, I'm sure all of our products have this one click, you know, add username, password, and now you're integrated to Salesforce. I don't know how many of them you have actually integrated to Salesforce like that in reality. Never happens that way, right? So having that person is super important because I insisted all our sales reps knew how to configure the product from the ground up, right? But that's not scalable. I mean, them knowing it is different from them having to do it, correct? Yeah. Um, and, and the sooner you bring this person in, the better your customers will also feel about what's being delivered to them and the more productive your sales reps are. So one more important point. So I'll have to drag this. Oh, uh, so in, in initial stages, having the tech co-founder working as a pre-sale and a post-sale consultant, actually as a sales engineer, what you would say, mm -hmm. it also helped us to actually refine the product faster. Because mm -hmm. the person actually participating in sales calls, participating in uh, POCs, participating in deployments could understand exactly what was the expectation and how product was behaving. And that helped us iterate very quickly. So even having a product uh, person at that point, I think is a no-brainer. No, especially you ask a question like, hey, how secure is your product? You, yeah. It should be the co-founder who architected the platform to say, this is how I built it, right? Because the first deal, for example, there is no reference power. There is no Fortune 500 <laughs> company using your product, correct? There's not even a, a Kiriana store using it yet. So it's super important that the person who built it with their own two hands comes in and stands for it. And then you'll realize that you've done a great job, but it isn't presenting itself well or something else. So fully, fully in, in support of the tech co-founder, you know, standing up and doing this in the first, I don't know, eight, 10 deals at least. Let me, I know I'm just hogging all the questions today and apologies to all the audience. As I said, this is going to be slightly different format because we are trying to bring everything together. One of the other areas of sales is usually channel sales or line sales or partnership sales, whatever name you want to give to it, right? And you usually have both partner influence sales and partner led sales, et cetera. There are all these sort of terminologies that exist in the industry. I don't know um, how important was partner sales to you, but as if it was, was it a separate organization was it one of the branches of your sales organization? How did you structure it? And when did you have a separate person just managing partner sales? So, yeah. Well, maybe maybe I, I, I have very strong opinions on this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, no, that's that's reason I, wanted to, I can see that I'm to. touching some, I'm, I'm touching some <laughs> nerves here. So please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I know Vinod has a strong opinion because I chat on Vinod. I took some of his suggestions also in early days. So maybe I wanted to take a tap first. <laughs> <laughs> so, so actually for us, I mean, uh, uh, like again, like our DNA was different. We are engineering guys, right? So we didn't know, first of all, sales and partnership was again completely different. So our initial partnership was not by design. It came as an opportunistic, uh, like we got inbound uh, from one of the uh, software vendors to become a partner. Uh, so it was, it was a, one of the first use case uh, as a partner channel. So I actually was uh, driving it uh, personally. Uh, it worked out. It worked out well, and then I, uh, along for the demonstration and other parts of sales cycle, I utilized a salesperson actually to work with me. Uh, once the partner partner deal was signed and uh, things were moving reasonably fine, where both the founders were involved and a couple of product guys and other guys were involved because it was a large fortune company and uh, like a lot of effort was going on. But it was it was it it, it, it was a good ROI for us. But the problem what we realized here was like we assumed it worked for this particular fortune company to as a partner with us 
this is what the ch- channel we should actually pursue aggressively and we started doing a lot of outbound talking to a lot of isvs and sis saying thinking that okay this is the channel we should explore it backfired we spent almost a year a lot of effort in this but things didn't materialize as expected i think what most of the partners expect here is uh, uh, a playbook which is very very crystal clear like what i'm going to which is who is your exact buyer what's going to be my pitch and what is in it for them because if you're going for an I, a si uh, if they are looking at 10 million 20 million dollar deal and you're saying i'm going to give you 50k or 80k it doesn't move needle for them right so so that, i think that was an initial mistake uh, also within within a size what we realized when we used to go to innovation departments pretty happy okay something innovative mm, that innovation departments kpi is to take it across to different practices within that si but when it goes to the practices even the practice head says okay it looks good but the guys who are on the ground the aes of the of the of that partner organization how do we activate those guys again a lot of partner enablement a lot of uh, effort needed that which initially we didn't realize we spent a lot of time once we got to 4 5 million arr we started realizing from the we start, the, the motion started other way around now like from the customers we started figuring out okay who has implemented this as course who has implemented this particular erp okay it was a particular si now go back to that si where you had initially some uh, interactions now say okay i have a, one large fortune company where i'm going to deploy my product and your team has implemented this why not we start working together now it resonates much better uh, they start realizing from the customer there is a there is a there is a pool for this particular category for this particular thing and it starts working uh, in that fashion so once we got uh, maybe to few million arr uh, uh, we got two or three uh, sis or isvs yeah. working we hired a first uh, sales uh, sorry partner uh, director actually and again he was a lot more uh, he had done a lot of partnership earlier uh, but also a lot more with a hustler uh, background awesome so i'm glad kadam remember that chat so um, so i'll tell you what you want to avoid without before i get into further detail almost every founder here and i've asked every founder i know and i've met and i've asked them this question have you ever been tempted by someone who says hey i'm in brazil i have a great network here Uh, and i will open up uh, this market for you and then the founder goes hi i'm not going to go to brazil anytime soon right what's the harm correct i let me whatever the harm is that it takes away your time even a minute of a founder's time going towards something unproductive is bad now if you say i don't need to do anything and they will sell then that's a a fallacy because someone needs to be super trained and enabled and whatever to be able to sell your product and lastly if you don't know what sells if you're trying to outsource the pain pain is what man i don't know what to sell or how to sell correct and this third party is going to come solve that problem for me then it's a case of i don't know what to sell and someone else is going to figure out what to sell so that's usually doesn't work so i wrote a piece on this long ago i don't even know where it is now but i loved what kadam said so i always said there are opportunistic sellers who say i have network rolodex blah 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 please avoid them like the plague right uh, channel sales happens when there is pull for the product not when you have to push right push sales doesn't work in the in the channel mode then there's partners who are essentially servicing the same market as you but they may or may not work there's a lot of nuance involved in whether that will work but the one kadam said was which was great which was they are actually solving for an adjacent use case which is hey i'm deploying their sales force your product sits on top of sales force correct and now there is a natural synergy partners like that may usually work but again early on in your life please don't invest your energies in building outbound the partner channel they will come organically and the one gem kadam gave you was go into your customers landscape and understand who are the partners they work with so a lot I, one of our startups i think works in the federal sector and you can't go to the federal sector without a partner involved their learning and understanding um, uh, that you need a partner is very very important a federally authorized partner right who already knows the players there that's your primary route to market not direct so it depends on obviously what your industry is but know what kind of a partner you're going for do not start very early once you figured out how to sell you figured out the customer landscape is full for your product is probably the right time and the right partners will show up and you'll be able to organically build this practice at that point in time it is a specialized sale because unlike a sales process which starts day one from wanting to sell partner development has a huge gestation period it doesn't yield you will not ramp a partner sales person the same way you will do a direct sales person hence you should specialize should have someone different running it so i have two more roles and i know i'm already 10 20 we have very little time so i'm going to ask you individually for one role each short answer we know at what time 
uh, at what point did you have your sales ops or rev ops person in the team? Uh, too late, should have been earlier. Uh, as soon as you can't count your uh, deals or your sales uh, stats on your fingertips, you must have a, a sales ops person. Rev ops may be subsequent, right? Um, if you're in a point wherein you're trying to figure out MVP, you're talking to 10, 15 companies and you know, you're know you moving all them, it's fine. But the moment you can't do that anymore, moment you need an Excel sheet even to track your opportunities, you should probably have a sales ops person on board sooner rather than later. Got it. And Kadim, a different one for you. At what point would you begin to think about sales onboarding and enablement uh, as a function or as a team uh, in itself? I think it, uh, as you evolve the startup, actually, most of the roles, uh, in hindsight, you believe it's you're already late because uh, when it's burning, when you feel the pain and then you start hiring, you, should, you always think you should have been six months earlier, but that's fine. I think that should be a little bit stretch. The same for even enablement, I would say if you were late, we were adding 20 AEs and 15, uh, 20 SDR, BDRs, like 40 people. Now, sales managers or the sales leaders or the BDR leaders were not able to, they were so busy in the existing opportunities, existing uh, deals, that they were not able to spend sufficient time on enabling the new AEs or spending new time with mentoring or coaching the right. new AEs, actually. So I think that's why we felt that we need to a systematic process to onboard the new sales guys, systematic process to onboard SDR, BDRs, and we created an enablement team. Now we have almost like six to seven people in, in this group. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, sorry if, uh, to the audience that I took all the time. A uh, few questions are on the Q&A board, which I'm going to take up. You can feel free to put more questions. I think Omang, your question is already answered. I think that's the part that we were covering. I'm going to take Sridhar's question next, which is, and either of you could take it. How did you define your ICP and the buying triggers in the early stages of your journey? And how has it evolved since then? Yeah, so ideally when you build something, I, I know you may not have a, we had our ICP profile on the wall very early, but even if you don't have it like that, to know who your ICP is, is super important. Like you can't possibly have built a product, probably having mortgaged your house, if you aren't sure who you're going to sell it to. Um, so <laughs> I'm just, just if you haven't, then please go back and do it. Because I genuinely think the greatest killer of deals is not knowing whom in the organization to send that very, very targeted missive to, right? Uh, so ICP, you, you better know the day you're building it. In our case, it was, hey, chief customer officer. And we even had a summit called the rise of the chief customer officer, um, wherein we said this role I know is not there, but there were people in the org who aspired to be the chief customer officer or CEOs were thinking about, I need a customer experience leader. Uh, and, and we built for that role and persona, right? And in terms of buying triggers, Again, it's a different pre-product market fit, post-product market fit. Pre-product market fit, buying trigger is a tactical one. Understanding what the pain point is, is this the right solution? You're looking at it that, at that level. Um, by the time you get to a medic kind of a process or some sort of a structured process is around the time we discussed around bringing specialists in, right? Which is, I'm getting a sales leader. I'm dividing my team. I'm looking at specialization. That is the time you look at how to make it repeatable, which is these are the, if this if eight out of these questions are a yes, you are ready to push a customer to move to the next level. So that's how it evolved. But when you're figuring out product market fit, pre-revenue, early revenue, that's what I guess most of the audience is. Don't get too caught on the technicalities of things like buying trigger. I generally think you can wait till you have a few customers and you actually know you can take them to customer success. Any different view, Karan, on this? Yeah, I think on the buying trigger, I completely agree with uh, Vinod. On, on ICP side, actually, uh, again, it evolved for us because we were quite new category and horizontal. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we always thought of somebody who has a who owns the adoption uh, responsibility of an application, be it the customer side or be it employee side. So customer side, a product owners, or an employee side, an operations guy or, uh, or, or a learning officer or someone. So that's how our ICP started getting evolved. But as we, as we, as we, as we uh, uh, got more mature as a company, we started realizing that catering to multiple use cases or multiple personas or the role specific roles which uh, which map was becoming harder because they started coming up with specific requirements so some of those buyer roles or some of those personas we started making as a nice to have like okay if they come as an opportunistic customer we'll onboard but we'll not cater to the requirement 
we figure out one exact uh, particular use case or one person, exact buyer person and go deeper there and we cater to them and we create a moat around that. Uh, so we we selected that and we started narrowing down. Uh, today also as a, as a company, I would say this keeps evolving. Like uh, a, a deal of uh, 1K would have been like so sweet maybe in the early first 10 ones. But then at some point we wanted 10K, then 100K. Now like uh, even 50K or 40K deals would not move the needle, right? So when you want to now get the quarter million, half a million, a million dollar kind of a deals, you're again by your persona, the people who have budget changes. Now what appeals them would be a little different than what you started five years back. Yeah. So I think it's a continuous evolution actually in the whole journey of a cycle. I'm sure sales, yeah. Salesforce is now looking at Salesforce is looking at hundred million dollar deals now, so thereby would be completely different. <laughs> Very important caveat I want to add is when you look at ICP, please know that if it's a straight shoot sale wherein I'm calling Alok on the phone, he's buying, he's using different story. As you go to enterprise, it's multi-stakeholder process. So if you're doing an ICP exercise, you may have your ICP in mind as a founder. What you don't have is the organization map of buyer, influencer, IT, yeah. who is the sort of roadblock or enabler. So at some point in time, you might need to get there because the conversation with all of these people will be very different. Lastly, procurement, who has no horse in the race, only job is to delay you and cut you down to size. So unless you have profiled these people and have your strategies for each, you'll probably realize ICP loves my product, but the product is not selling because procurement is saying 30% of what ICP agreed. So that, sure. that's probably a good add to this. Yeah. I'll take one last question uh, from Devashish which is when do you bring in a sales commission structure? Is it from day one with the first hire or is it at a later stage when the team has grown? Yeah, I'll, I'll let me start with this. I'm sure we know we'll have more professional answer here. But uh, uh, from again, in, uh, with the caveat of engineering as a... So I've, I've, what I've realized is actually, uh, if, you, if you initially, if you don't have any sales commission, I would say incentives. So you, we, we had a variable structure where, where a sales guy meets a quota, he would get a 100% variable. And when, she, when the person goes above the quota, he starts getting additional uh, incentive on top of it, right? So if, in, if, if, I, if I didn't have that quote, in incentive on top of uh, crossing the quota, I'm actually capping, capping my growth itself. So it's better to incentivize. And I think sales guys always look how they can double up their earning uh, by uh, getting more deals. That's one. The most important aspect on the commission part was actually incentivizing the behavior, what you need for the company. So I'll really give a couple of examples here. Like in early days, we were getting most of our deals uh, where customers were expecting monthly or quarterly billing or MRR or QRR. We wanted to convert this to ARR, like having multi year, sorry, uh, yearly up for annual upfront deals actually, or annual deals. So we started giving spiff or commission, additional commission, additional spiff to the sales saying, okay, uh, we need, uh, uh, if you if you close an annual deal, we'll give you additional commission. Uh, in fact, before putting the spiff, when I asked sales guys, they used to come back. If I ask annual, annual upfront, most customers are saying it's a deal breaker, they're not signing. Uh, they said it will not work. But as soon as I put the spiff, every month, like there were four to five deals which with annual upfront, it suddenly started changing. Similarly, after after a couple of years, it became a table stake. Like uh, ninety, uh, like almost ninety five percent of our deals were coming annual. So we removed that spiff and convert it to multi year upfront, saying having a two year, three year, or four year deals. Now you get a commission. For annual is like it's not it's 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 a table stake. ARR is your quota and all. And we started saying like every month there are three or four deals which is now annual upfront. Similarly, at some point we wanted to push our uh, onboarding packs or we wanted to push on add on. So we started giving spiff for that. So wherever we wanted to incentivize the behavior, I think those spiff or those incentive structure really played a beautiful role. Actually, I don't know how the, sorry, Khadim and Vinod, the question was slightly different, which is saying people are not questioning whether incentives are important and how to structure mm -hmm. them. When, mm -hmm. when you hire a first salesperson, will, will that be on flat compensation for the first salesperson? Or will there be incentive even for that first salesperson? Or when you get to five, six salespeople, do you begin to put these structures? Also, we I had I had a, I had a, some structure uh, incentive structure from the first salesperson itself because you need to motivate them, you need to incentivize them, and it just becomes more scientific or more structured as you scale up. So you see, in the US, the problem may be solved for you itself, as in no sales rep will join without a fixed uh, plan around yeah. comp and spiff sure. and ramp and all of that. Right, so that problem is solved for you by that market. But in your founding team, if you have two three salespeople, keep the levers. Um, uh, a little flexible because you don't, I'm, I'm actually a huge fan of accelerators and spiffs 
because you don't know what as you start seeing the data and like oh wow okay this is important you can add spiffs right to accelerate the process so us you may need it early in india if you're starting off or you are even in the us if you have a core founding team don't get too technical on what the goaling is for your first core team i'm literally talking only core team right so that you can discover what are the behaviors you want to drive what are the leading indicators of success and then you do it i'll give you a small example a lot of people who had sdrs who were incentivized on qualified leads founders who reached 20 30 million arr you ask them they will tell you they are now going and adding either an accelerator or even a qualifier that how many of them actually closed so it's not just the hand off criteria that you are comped on but there's actually something else that is tagged to actual closure of the deal because that's proof of the pudding because you'll realize people get very good at handing over qualified leads that actually don't close right yeah. so it's a it's a moving spectrum us that problem is solved for you in your core team if you can avoid hyper uh, definition around what the spiff uh, what the sorry variable gets earned out by it allows you to discover what leading indicators indicate success and then you can build on that but when you scale your team you 100% need uh variable comp maybe even from the first rep you hire fantastic i know we have reached the end of our time and as i said big in the beginning apologies to the listeners that i dominated the questions today but i wanted to sort of go through the entire evolution from being an infant to sort of a more uh, mature sales force thank you khadim thank you vinod look uh, i have a point to make i have a point to make sure so very important I don't know how many of you in the audience after hearing all of this thought Kadim was the product founder tech founder doesn't know sales he sounded like a vp of sales and I would really want you to take that on there is no escaping the fact that you need to understand your sales organization there is no non sales founder if you thought I'm the sales founder and Kadim is the tech founder I'm sure you like if you didn't tell you that and asked you who was who I am 100% sure none of you would have put him as the Uh, as a tech founder except for the lines where he says i'm the tech founder so super important guys there is no escaping the fact that founder is the first sales person in the company and, and you need a, you, you need a mentors or uh, advisors like all of you right ask you the right question at the right time <laughs> thank you well thank you everyone for this wonderful discussion i truly enjoyed it uh, and until we start again in 2022 all right thank, thank you thanks guys awesome. cheers take care